This morning we continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, as uh, you know, we've been uh, studying it for several months now, going on three months. Uh, this is a sermon that Jesus preached, and uh, as I told you from the beginning uh, of the series, it is not an easy uh, series, it's not an easy set of messages, and we have dealt with quite a bit. Uh, these next six messages here, we have dealt with something that uh, Jesus would say to the Pharisees, it has been said, but I say to you. There are six statements that he said something like that about. We have already talked about the first one where he says, he talked about avoiding anger, because anger is like murder. Secondly, we talked about last week, uh, to avoid lust and adultery. And today, we're going to talk about avoiding divorce. And again, this subject matter obviously is sensitive. It is delicate. It is even painful. And uh, many people actually, even from pastor's point perspectives, don't preach on it. How many of you have heard a message on divorce in the past five years? Very few. Because that's not something that's pleasant, it's very difficult to deal with, yet it is so important because the reason that we want to talk about uh, avoiding divorce is because we want to really amplify marriage and why God created marriage. Uh, one of the things that uh, is taking place is that the rate of divorce in the Christian community is rising above the rate of divorce in the secular world. Something is wrong with that picture, because we're supposed to be the ones that actually have more understanding and more uh, empowerment from God to be able to overcome some of the difficulties that we face in marriage, but yet it's going down. Uh, one of the greatest uh, things in life that brings us happiness in reality is a happy marriage, and I've studied this before. Uh, for me... What stresses me the most is not my job, it's not pastoring, as difficult as it is. One of the things that stresses me the, the most is when things are not going well at home. There are no perfect marriages, so we all go through struggles, but when things are not right at home, there's, there's nothing right inside. And so that's because God created it in such a way for us to be able to enjoy this union that he brings together. This is something that rich people can enjoy, poor people can enjoy. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, you can enjoy it because it is God that created it. So my prayer today as we think about this particular uh, difficult message that God will give you a sense of understanding uh, to recognize where you're at, what's going on in your life, and what you can do about it. Now, I have to admit I'm doing a series, so therefore, whatever comes next, I'm going to preach on. And last week was a very difficult week. Uh, one of the teenagers said to their parents, last week, pastor schooled us on sex, sex ed from the pulpit, because we talked about all kinds of issues that's going on in the world. And if we don't have the freedom to talk about them in the church, I want to guarantee you what your children will hear outside of the church is not going to be compatible with what the Bible talks about. So it was very difficult last week, and you're still here, so I am glad that you did not abandon me. Uh, but as I came back to this next particular text here, I paused for a little bit and said, you know, last week was so difficult, do I really want to preach on something difficult again this week, until God gently encouraged me to recognize that God is the one that created marriage. Marriage is a wonderful thing, so therefore, we should amplify, we should get excited about it, and that changed my whole perspective about this being difficult is not really the big problem here, but the fact that I want to encourage us. Uh, to consider marriage and to consider the beauty of marriage and to recognize that it is a gift from God and to do whatever we can to avoid divorce. So 
And, and, so, and some of you here are, are divorced. And again, uh, you might be feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And some of you might be thinking about divorce, and that might feel a little bit uncomfortable. But I want your experience to be able to help somebody else. And I want to address our young people, especially in that area where they are, they are about to make a decision in their lives uh, to pick a partner, and they're struggling trying to figure out, you know, who am I going to pick as a husband or wife? And uh, it's not easy. And I want to sort of give the warning ahead of time how important it is to be careful in the beginning process to make the right choice from the start rather than suffer the difficulties that come later on when things don't work out. So I wanted to begin this whole uh, message here with the understanding of marriage. I shared a little bit about it last week, but I want to continue to remind us, God designed the concept of marriage. It was not something that mankind came up with. Mankind didn't decide one day, you know, let's get together and have a family. And that'd be a great thing. No, God created the whole thing. We go from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, where it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 and following, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And verse 24 is very important. It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. God's going to join them, and the two shall become one flesh. So what constitutes marriage? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says this in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her, for he says the two shall become one flesh. And last week we covered this in, in the, the area of trying to help young people or older people to recognize that the one flesh, uh, one, uh, flesh concept is not just because of a legal document, our, our marriage is not just because, you know, the pastor says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Neither is it a divorce decree just because it's a, it's a paper that's been signed by authorities that makes it official. We have to go back to the place where God is the one who joins us. And I said to, to, to you last week, uh, the joining together of becoming one flesh is through the sexual intimacy between a man and a woman. That's really what makes you one flesh. Marriage sort of blesses that. But some of us have gone outside of marriage and gotten together with other people, and what we understand here is the fact they've become one, one flesh with somebody else. And we're going to talk a little bit about this concept of, of being joined together because when we are joined together... The notion is, from the Greek, that you are glued together. You're glued together. Now, I want to ask you this question here. When you take two things and you glue them together, when you decide to unglue it, how difficult is it to unglue? Very difficult, isn't it? And when you succeed in ungluing it, the, do the two pieces still look the same? No, there's always a residue of something on one or the other. And this is where when God joins us, he says, we are glued together 
And therefore, we need to make sure we don't try to unglue it because it can never happen without damage, without pain, without hurt. There are amicable divorces, but they're never painless. Every divorce is always going to be painful. And therefore, God wants to protect us from that pain. And that's why he says that he doesn't want us to be divorced. And certainly here, as Jesus was being tested by the Pharisees, he wanted them, he wanted them to understand that marriage is once and for all until death do us part. So in the eyes of God, marriage is a spiritual union. It involves physical union, but it's also a spiritual union. Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It is something that God created. In the eyes of man, again, it is only a signed document. And some people have said, you know, well, you know, why do we need to be concerned about getting married? Because some people have sort of seen so much divorce that they see, they're thinking the antidote to divorce is living together. Because if you're living together, if you separate, it's not as bad as if you get divorced. Because after all, marriage is nothing but a signed paper. And again, I remind you, marriage is more than a signed paper. Divorce is more than a signed paper as well. God wants us to come together, to be joined together, to become one, because that's his design. Now, what keeps a, mar what keeps a marriage alive? Uh, three things that I want to share with you that keeps a marriage alive. One is spiritual unity. If, you, if, you, if you're trying to get involved in a relationship with someone, make sure that you are equally yoked. Make sure that you are both in the same spiritual level, so to speak. Because if you're not, something is going to happen that's not going to be pretty down the line. And I know people sometimes, feel, you know, just, I, they just fall in love with one another and they think, you know, that, you know, as long as we're in love, obviously it's going to work. Now I want to ask you a question. Who do you know when they came and said their vows had the intention to get divorced some years down the line? Nobody does that. We come and get married because we love each other. But yet the same thing, ha so sometimes it happens that people get divorced. So nobody intends that, but when they are falling in love, sometimes they just overlook everything else. All the difference of, of religion, and that's a very, very important aspect. Because when you raise your kids, you always wonder, how are we going to raise them? And so it is a spiritual, uh, we, ha we have to have a sense of spiritual unity in this process. Because there's something that happens when you're in the same wavelength spiritually. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and following says this, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, that's the Apostle Paul talking, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And listen to these words. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There's a sense that as you are in Christ, you have all these things that you can develop, these characteristics, humility, gentleness, patience, love. All these things have to come, have to be in play when you're in the relationship and it's not the love that the world shows us, it's the love that God shows us that's sacrificial. And this is where it makes a huge difference whether you marry someone that is a Christian or not, because you won't have the same values. Falling in love is only going to last for a little bit. Eventually, that's going to fade out. What holds a marriage together are your convictions based on the values that you hold. Secondly, supernatural love. We need to have that love that's beyond just, again, what I said earlier, what the, the, the world considers love. In John chapter 15, verse 9 and following, says, Jesus says, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, 
just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full or made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus is calling us to a level of love that is beyond what the world can offer. And that's why it's so important for us to continue to grow in our, in our spiritual maturity, allowing the Spirit of God to come in us, because the Bible tells us we need to be able to even love our enemies. That kind of love is deep down that just comes from somewhere, and that place is God. Only the Spirit of God can cause that. And the third thing that keeps a marriage alive is that sense of sexual purity. And last week we talked a lot about sexual purity in thought, deeds, and conversations. Again, Matthew 5, 27 and 28 says, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I said to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That sense of Jesus is trying to clarify to uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, don't, don't try to just look at it from one direction here. I want, to, I want you to know I see your heart and I see what's in your heart, and you can sin in your heart. You can sit in your mind, in your thoughts. And Jesus made it very clear that sexual purity has to be part of our existence as we, have, as we are in relationship with one another. As we try to understand divorce, again, from our text in Matthew 5, verse 31, it says, It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. A paper signed by two witnesses is basically all they had to have, and they could send their wives away. Now, it's interesting because when we read Scripture, a lot of us sometimes don't have the full understanding of where these, the context of these Scriptures are coming from. And uh, when you begin to really think about it, it makes such a huge difference because God doesn't say things just out of the blue. He has, he has something in mind. He has a point of reference and this is going to be interesting as we look at what the issue is here. I want, I want us to go to Matthew 19, verse 3 and following, as we read earlier. It says, some Pharisees came to Jesus, again, testing him and asking. And I want you to see the question that's being asked over here. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Keep that in mind. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, he didn't answer the question really. He went back, he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of, of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, now Jesus puts an exception there, except for immoral, immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Very intriguing, because this whole thing is coming from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verse 1. And I want to read that for you. Because it says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it, it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out uh, from his house, then he's all done with her. That was from Deuteronomy chapter 24. But there's a particular word there that I want to sort of emphasize. When a man takes a wife and marries her, verse 1, and it, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. Some indecency in her. Now, there's two schools of thought in this, in this whole uh, particular passage. There were two rabbis that um, looked at it differently. 
Again, from Matthew 19, 3, some Pharisees came testing Jesus and asked the question, right? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? So Rabbi uh, Shammai says that Deuteronomy 24, 1, when he says indecency, that means marital unfaithfulness. But Rabbi Hillel translate indecency as anything that was displeasing with the, with the wife. So in other words, if the wife cooked a bad meal, he could say to her, I divorce you. Right? That was, that was legal. If she woke up and he looked at her and didn't find her attractive anymore, he could say, I divorce you. So that's why it's so important to understand the question from the Pharisees was this, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Because this, interestingly enough, we talked about adultery last week, and Jesus put that before divorce. Because what these men were trying to do is really trying to have their way to have as many women as possible in a legal way. Because... They found some indecency, and Hillel said that indecency was anything that they wanted it to be. But God straightened the whole, Jesus straightened the whole thing out by saying, that's not the case. The case is only for unfaithfulness. Marital unfaithfulness can you divorce your wife. And again, this goes down deep because if you go even... Um, in Matthew 19, 8, Jesus said to them, because of, the, of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it, was not, it has not been this way. It has not been this way from the beginning. God didn't create it that way. As a matter of fact, Malachi 2, 16 says, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, very strong words. But Jesus is not saying God hates the divorcee. He just hates divorce. You know why he hates divorce? For the same reason he hates every sin. Because every sin eventually does not affect just you, but it affects more than you. It affects everyone around you. And when you think about divorce, it affects the whole design of God. Number one. Number two, it affects children in the relationship. I said this morning, I have not yet met a child of a divorced family that was emotionally stable. Now, that is not to say that children in regular families are not emotionally unstable as well, but in divorce cases, there's always a sense of insecurity. And I'm sharing that only because if that has happened in your life, in your family, you need to pay attention to that and really try to work with the children especially to help them understand, yet this happened. You may be feeling a certain way, and we can, we can work with that. So you can begin to develop a sense of, of uh, uh, stability in your, and, and, and sort of having that... Uh, I can't think of the word. But that sense of security, to stand on your own, not, not to... Because again, what happens to our parents sometimes can happen to us, and we can say, well, it happened to my parents. If it happens to me, it's okay. And, and we need to understand that just because something happened to our parents doesn't mean it's okay, number one, doesn't mean it has to happen to us. And it is, it, it is our responsibility as parents to be able to encourage our children to say, you know, there's a better way. And so for those of you that may be divorced, uh, you need to sort of take that as an opportunity to help other people not to go through the same thing. Because it is very painful. It is very difficult. It also affects relationships, right? In-laws. You have some in-laws that just get along well with each other, but they can't meet anymore as often as they used to because now there's a separation. And within uh, friends, your friendships are affected even, right? Because now you're not with your husband, you're not with your wife, and your friends are feeling sort of kind of, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm taking sides, and so the best thing to do is sort of stay away. It affects a whole bunch of things. 
Just like every sin. Divorce is not a worse sin than another sin. And God hates every sin because it hurts us. It affects us. And God wants us to experience his full joy, the fullness of who he is. And therefore, we need to pay attention to these things. The only grounds for divorce is really marital unfaithfulness. Anything else is just being disobedient to God, and there's a price to be paid. And as I said in my conclusion, uh, in, in, your, in your outline, it's not the unpardonable sin. But I want you to know you need to fight for your marriage for the sake of who God is and for the sake of your children. Now, sometimes things just don't work out. We understand that. But for you who are looking to have a partner... I want you to look very carefully. Now, sometimes we have this whole sense of, you know, I have an idea of the kind of wife that I want, or I have an idea of the kind of husband that I want, and we have a list that they need to meet. Right? We write all these things, this is what I want to look for in a wife. And I want to ask you, whatever you are outlining that you want to see in a wife, you need to ask yourself the question, do I have what it takes for this woman that has all these characteristics to say yes to me. Right? Because sometimes we are looking for this perfection here while we want to stay imperfect. Or vice versa. It's not going to work. And I want to say to all of you uh, in, in that area, in that, in that uh, phase of your life where you're looking for a partner, be very careful. The person that you're looking at has a history that you need to be aware of. And uh, you need to figure out where they're coming from. You need to figure out what their, their pain, their dysfunction. After you process that, if you still want to go ahead with that relationship, you can do so, but make sure you understand there's a lot of dysfunction going on. And unfortunately, we seem to attract the kind of person that we are. And so if we're dysfunctional, a lot of times we attract dysfunctional people around us. And that's why I say, you want to make that list of what you're looking for in your mate? Then you need to look at that list and say, can I, can I be that person that this woman or this man will look for? Let me begin to change who I am to be the best that I can be so that when that woman or that man comes my way, it'll be a match. It makes a huge difference how we look at all this. Now, I'm going to conclude with this here. What about abuse and addictions? Now, we live in a society that there is a lot of abuse and addiction that goes on. Uh, I want to say God does not condone an abusive relationship. Now, sometimes we have been like, uh, like the scribes and Pharisees uh, that say, says, can you divorce your wife for any reason at all? And some of us have just decided, let me define abuse. And we can come up with the, you know, the fact that you know, I'm being beaten up, that's abuse. Or I'm just not being cared for enough, that's abuse. We go into the whole area of emotional abuse, mental abuse, and we need to make sure we understand what that abuse is. Let's not give ourselves a way out. But if it is an abusive relationship, if it is a place that's dangerous for you or your children, then you need to leave. You don't have to stay in that relationship because God wouldn't want that. But again, above all, what I want to communicate to us today is the fact that life is difficult. Relationships are the most difficult things to work at. A lot of times we, we work at everything else in life except in our relationship. We think that for some reason or another, when we decide to marry somebody, you know, it's going to fall from above and we're going to be filled with all these qualities and these abilities to deal with relationships. Relationships are very complex. People are complex. Cultures are complex. So it's not an easy thing. And I understand that. And I want to encourage you, wherever you're at in this, in, in this particular context here, let God minister to you. Let God give you direction. Seek that direction. 
It makes a big difference. It is a very painful thing. Let God minister to you. Don't be hasty about it. Because you understand, God designed it, and because God designed it, it's a great thing. If it's not working, I have to look at what am I doing that's causing it not to work. And we need to seek peace. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, we began with the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes talked about that whole sense of being poor in spirit, being gentle, being peacemakers, and all these things. Uh, Chrysostom, an early church father, Archbishop of Constantinople, said this. It says, For he that is meek and a peacemaker and poor in spirit and merciful, how shall he cast out his wife? He that is used to reconcile others, how shall he be at variance with her that is his own? That sense, again, we go all the way back to the Beatitudes, the beginning of chapter 5, all these characteristics that God says, this is the kind of person we ought to be. And as I said from the beginning, if we can, if we can develop these attributes, allow God to work them out in us, it will help us through every aspect of our lives. And Chrysostom just puts it in context here, saying, if you're a peacemaker, if you're meek, if you're gentle, why would you not try to work it out with your wife or your husband? Because God is saying, with him, all things are possible. As difficult as it is, with God, all things are possible. And again, I pray that you will just receive this um, as God guides you and directs your, your thoughts and your pro, as you process it. Not an easy thing to think about or deal with, but we want to look, to look out for each other's best interests. We want to submit to one another, and ultimately we want to submit to God. And God wants to bless us as his children. And all these things that he puts there, all these commandments, always is to protect us from the pain that comes from breaking any one of them. Let us pray. Just close your eyes and bow your heads and just let this sit with you. And again, wherever you are in this particular context, let God minister to you. Above all, I want to reassure you that God loves you. The Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. God cries when we hurt. And I just want to reassure you that God loves you. If you are divorced, or if you're thinking about divorce, he loves you. Let him minister to you. Gracious God, once again, we want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy towards us. Father, only you know the brokenness in the hearts of those who have gone through divorce, or are going through divorce, or are thinking about it. You know their conflict, and I pray that you administer to them. Grant them the experience of your love and comfort. I pray that you may guide each one. Father, for those who are married, I pray that you protect our marriages. 
But we recognize the sanctity of it. We recognize that you are the architect of it. And you designed it for our own happiness. So teach us to protect our marriages. Father, I want to lift up those who are not married, who are seeking a mate, that you may give them wisdom and discernment in their relationships, as their date, as they get to know each other. Prepare them. Help them to be aware of what is in front of them. Give them wisdom. Give them discernment. Father, as we go from here, I pray that you help us. Minister to us. Continue to uplift us. Be glorified in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.